Let's look at snoring. Snoring is the exchange of a large volume of air through a narrowed space. Most of your work involves opening up the airways, but airway size is relative to the amount of air that you're passing through it. I think it would be really good to also bring down the breathing volume. I work with people with snoring all of the time and I don't do anything with the airway space and I get results. And all I'm doing is resetting the respiratory center to bring the person's breathing volume down to more normal. If you're breathing two to three times more than what's required and the respiratory center has been reset to that heavy volume of breathing, well then of course you're going to have friction in the airways. There's two factors we need to take into account with snoring and with obstructive sleep apnea. How, how big are the airways, but how much air are you trying to bring through the airways? So addressing one is only addressing half of the problem. Would you snore if your breathing was silent? Would you snore if your breathing was quiet? Would you snore if there's no visible movements from the chest or tummy? How you breathe at rest is of course going to influence your breathing during the, your night time. If your breathing is normal at rest, your breathing is going to be normal during your sleep. Obstructive sleep apnea. Men and women with nasal obstruction, especially chronic nighttime symptoms of rhinitis, are more likely to be habitual snores and a proportion will have obstructive sleep apnea. There's a lot of papers showing this link here. Um, I've just put up one just to, to, to tie it in a little bit. ADHD, most children with ADHD displayed symptoms and skin prick test results consistent with allergic rhinitis and that's really the topic we're, we're looking at. How do we get a child? How do we address allergic rhinitis? So your patients are coming in with their open mouths, undeveloped jaws, sleep problems, fatigue and possible ADHD. So we're not just addressing um, malocclusions or, you know, we're, we're really addressing that child's health for the rest of their life. It has a massive impact and I, I will testify to that personally, it had a huge impact on my life. When you learn to unblock the nose and get the tongue up into the roof of the mouth and keep the mouth closed, it is a massive change. Children who mouth breathe typically do not sleep well, causing them to be tired during the day and possibly unable to concentrate on academics. And if the child becomes frustrated in school, he or she may exhibit behavioral problems. That's written by a dentist, Dr. Josh Jefferson. And of course, this is something that you know more about than I do. Craniofacial changes, oral breathing in children may lead to the development of facial structural abnormalities associated with sleep disordered breathing. We postulate that the switch to oral nasal breathing that that occurs with chronic nasal conditions is a final common pathway for sleep disordered breathing. It's published in CHEST. It's a well-respected journal, 2003.